So scene talk is about serverless 2.0 using closed state dot io and stateful functions with python yeah really interesting yeah so, i'd like to talk about oh uh, should i start yeah you're gonna start but i i don't know if you if you are sharing your screen that's no all right cool so yeah i'd like to talk today about um cloud state io it's an open source uh, uh around uh, what we like to call serverless 2.0 uh which is actually stateful serverless um, versus the stateless serverless we've been used to with things like Amazon uh, Lambda function as a service. Um, I'm Sean Walsh. I'm field CTO and cloud evangelist uh, with Lightbend, who is behind this effort. So Berkeley recently uh, made a prediction that serverless computer computing is going to dominate the future of cloud, and we agree. So why serverless 2.0? Why the next iteration? Function as a service was a great start. It gave us the mechanisms, a way of thinking around um, creating these components that we can begin to manage uh, and take away the operational difficulties on behalf of developers. But it was only the first step and we need to iterate. Function as a service is not equal to serverless. Serverless can be much more. We need to be able to allow coarse grain what we call general purpose applications to exist in serverless. So not exactly what you would call uh, a little uh, fine grain function, but maybe an entire application might be able to be deployed to a serverless platform. So function as a service to revisit, great for embarrassingly parallel processing, orchestration, stateless applications, job schedule or orchestration, uh, things like that, especially things that are um, uh, very low impact on the database, um, quickly being able to retrieve data, make a decision and write data back. What it's bad at is reasoning about as a holistic application, making any sort of serverless platform guarantees around uh, two reactive tenants. One is called responsiveness and the other one's called resilience. You need to be able to make these assumptions that these characteristics exist to be able to have any kind of a serverless platform. Um, and gen again, general purpose applications. So function as a service gave us the abstraction of communication uh, and it, it works great as long as everything is fast flowing and smooth and uh, any given function isn't probably trying to do too much. So the message is input, the function is uh, hosted somewhere, it does some thinking, and then a message comes out, simple as that. And the operational concerns are handled for us. Um, it's the first steps of, of, of being opsless. So um, here's, here's a little bit of a beginning of the problem. So message in the function now is doing something in the middle. It's reading from a database, maybe more than one database, maybe it's doing joins, um, and then a message goes out. The big problem here is that that database interaction is a really big black box. We have no idea what's going on. There's no guidelines to manage it. Uh, it, it that means if you're equating one function to another, you really can't do it because they do very different things. Um, there's no systematic way to reason about what each one's doing. A function as a black box. What is missing here is state. So far, when we talk about stateless applications, they really are stateful, um, but that state exists in your database. Um, it's a little bit unnatural because things in space like us and our cars and our phones, those things have a current state. They're not separate from their state. Um, I think that's a, that's a problematic concept from the beginning, but something we're very used to as developers. So serverless 2.0, what we propose is that real-time database access has to be removed uh, to allow this sort of autonomy and reliability of our functions to be able to uh, reason about them in a, in, a, in a way that's uniform. We can't make these guarantees if we're passing an entire data set to a function um, of saying, hey, here's all the data set, do what you need to do, because we're trying to create an abstraction, or to allow unbridled reads uh, from within those functions as, as can exist in function as a service. So function as a service, again, abstracting over communication, the message comes in, the function does some thinking, reads some data and the message comes out. Stateful serverless, we do the same sort of thing. The message comes in from a user or another system, uh, the function does some thinking and the message comes out, but also we are sending state in at some point in time, probably 
at initialization time, we're sending state in, and the user function is then holding its individual state on behalf of whatever domain it's serving, it's able to make the decision without having to talk to a database. And then when it makes a decision, the new state goes out somewhere because it will need to be reinstantiated at a future point in time, or it might have to be reinstantiated because uh, it's on an unhealthy node and, and it has to be re reinstantiated somewhere else. Um, so we've really just um, introduced this concept of state, but that's not quite enough. Again, we can't pass the entire data set in as part of this flow. We have to figure something out. It's under cloud state. So cloud state is this, I'm going to read this rotely. Cloud state is a distributed, clustered, and stateful cloud runtime, providing a zero ops experience with polyglot client support. What we'd like to say is essentially serverless 2.0. It's open source, best of breed, harnessing um, all the all the power of open source technologies uh, while removing the complexity as much as possible from things like Kubernetes and whatever database you're going to be using, be it span or be it SQL, no SQL. Um, we really just lift, lift it up to make it so developers don't need to think about the ins and outs, all these things. You leave it to this platform. So you wouldn't worry about uh, the complexity of, dis of distributed systems, high scale systems, um, managing your service meshes, your databases, the state, how does the state get to the function? Uh, those things are all managed for you. Um, routing, recovery, failover, all those things are inherent. Um, and then operationalizing and running your applications. Um, it's really just a matter of hooking into a CLI, into your build process, and it automatically, automatically will go into whatever environment and be running. And then you'll have all the benefits of a stateful platform that is elastic and scalable and all this. So some of the technical highlights of cloud state is it's polyglot. Um, any computing language that has gRPC capabilities is fair game to be a, uh, a client for cloud state. So no longer do you need to have a team that is comfortable in a language and you need to find platforms for that language. This is a, a language agnostic platform. Everyone should be able to play. And I think it's important enough that that's, that's a really important concept. Um, it's got really great state models. So event sourcing, that's really important for us. To stay, uh, I, I alluded to the fact that you can't pass the entire data set in. There's one useful constraint that we found to make this all possible, and that is event sourcing. I'll talk more about that in a few. Um, command query responsibility segregation. Uh, which we're also calling domain projections. So your reads are separate from your rights of your system. So your, your events are modeled and the events are the events. And then any number of interested parties could take those events and paint whatever picture across the system they want asynchronously. Key value store, uh, create update, uh, create read, update, delete. Um, and in advance, one of the advanced topics I find uh, is CRDTs, uh, conflict-free replicated data types. Um, if you're not familiar, they're a highly available distributed uh, sort of a read source. Uh, and it's a, it's a multiple structures that keep in sync. Uh, so when you go to read something, it'll be in memory. Um, and if you're talking in a cluster, it'll be very highly available in almost every single node that you're running. And we're also PolyDB, so it's whatever, whatever database you choose. Uh, it, it'll hook into cloud state seamlessly. Um, so the, at a high level, the technologies that we're using are ACA, ACA Open Source Concurrency Toolkit, uh, gRPC, which is the way we're able to uh, have a, a, a low-level communication between the cloud state mechanisms and internals to whatever language you're implementing it in, um, as well as a, a, a contract with the outside for your users. Um, you, could, you could have people call into cloud state services using gRPC or REST or anything else. Um, uh, K-native Graal, Graal's important because uh, across these different languages, some of them are JVM languages. Um, they have a little bit of baggage. There's garbage collection, things like that. We need to be able to compile everything with a native image um, that will be able to guarantee sub-second uh, startup of pods and Kubernetes, um, which really, again, gives us these guarantees that we could be elastic and quickly scale up new nodes. And all this, of course, running on Kubernetes. So I alluded to the fact that we've got a useful constraint 
Um, and this is by a theologian, believe it or not, is, and he said that freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding the right ones, the liberating restrictions. So sometimes a restriction can actually set you free as we think in this case. So this constraint for us is event sourcing for cloud state. So some of the benefits of event sourcing, it's a single source of truth for full history. Um, it allows for this memory image, this durable state um, uh, running um, inside of some encapsulation. In this case, it's a, a cloud state we call entity or a CRDT uh, or a CRUD entity. Um, and uh, it, it allows the building of the state from the events over time because events are a time series. It avoids ob object relational mismatch. Um, a lot of that's also in combination with CQRS. Um, which is the way to separate your reads from your rights. Um, I don't know how many of us have gone and designed a system and we've laid everything out according to domain and we're very proud of it. And then the UI people come over and say, hey, I need this and I need that. And we just pollute our domain. Um, the read and write concerns of your system are two completely different things and they were equally important. Um, one shouldn't affect the other. Um, and it allows subscriptions to these state changes. So you subscribe to events and the event is useful for different parties for different reasons. Um, I like to use the term state is in the eye of the beholder. Um, you could have a state of something, let's just say uh, an airline flight, and there's all kinds of characteristics of flight, but ground control cares about very different things than in-flight control. Um, so it's, it's important to bear that in mind. State is not something to be shared across different processes. It has mechanical sympathy. Uh, you're only ever appending with events. So this is how event sourcing works with cloud state. We have our user function. We're also calling that an entity. The entity is that holder of state. Now, when you instantiate it, the event log is replayed. So all the events in the past on behalf of this entity are replayed to it and it's building up its current state. Um, I don't know if I talk about snapshots here. I probably don't, if you have the question. Um, if there are a real lot of events where there's a concept of snapshot, so you start with a state snapshot and then you, you overlay the events since, um, just in case. Uh, so the events come in, build up your state, and now you're ready for business. Your commands are coming in. Um, somebody saying, <clears throat> hey, add a contact to a, uh, to a customer. And you're looking at your state. You're saying, okay, I can do that. You add the contact and you say, hey, I added the contact or I'm about to add the contact. And then the event is contact added and it's now um, in the system of record. And when you instantiate again, that event will be played back to you so you can then build up that state. So you'll see that contact in memory in the future. Um, and the state will also be reflected um, inside the entity that has just written the event. It'll update its state in memory as it does so. So the happy path for um, one of these functions is the, uh, the user issues a command to, to do something on the domain. It goes into a mailbox. All of these entities are bounded by a mailbox. Um, it, so there's no issues for concurrency. There's no blocking at all. Um, these functions uh, fully process a message and event it out before even thinking about going in and getting another message off the mailbox. And so that command now you does some thinking, looks at its state, issues a new event, which goes to the event log, which may be subscribed to through some event bus. Now let's talk about the unhappy path. So the sad path, this is recovering from failure. So we, we have our event log, we're replaying our events. Uh, it's, it's actually building up state in the function. And now we're ready for business again, in comes our command and now goes events. And you can also do CRUD. So um, in some cases, event sourcing, um, CQRS, CRDTs, they're all pretty advanced concepts. You might have just a, a subsystem, which is just a user, um, uh, uh, maybe a user and a phone number or something like that. You know, how many things do you really need to do on that? Does it really need events? Um, you could use a current state model and you can use CRUD, we can handle that. So in that case, we just use snapshots your snapshot comes into you, you put it in memory, and then you're processing messages and then you're sending the snapshot back up, back out every time. So what is the architecture for something like this? So again, we're running on Kubernetes um, and we've got uh, a series of pods that represent your user functions. 
So um, you've got replication here. Um, you can have any number of these as required. Um, if you're running one user function, you probably would never need more than a couple pods, one pod. Um, but you can host multiple user functions in one image. Um, and therefore, it's useful to have more than one pod and you can scale it up and down. So your user functions live on these pods in whatever language you've implemented, communicating via gRPC. And then we have the cloud state proxy, which is the ACA sidecar on these pods, which spans these pods. And so ACA is actually receiving the messages from the users and it's communicating to your user code via gRPC. Your user code is doing all the logic, all the thinking. Um, it's just all of the, 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 uh, the traffic control and the, uh, the ability to write the events and, and, and to be able to play back your state, all that is on the left side. Uh, your user function is doing all the business logic. And the, the ACA sidecar is also communicating in real time to the data store whenever necessary or asynchronously. So, um, so that ACA sidecar lives on each pod alongside your user code. Um, it spans those pods, but it is also a cluster in itself. So ACA cluster exists for your, for your, um, your application, which is a series of these functions. You've got a cluster that could be expanded and contracted to do its work. And so that's how the, the communication location, um, location, you might have a user function on pod three, um, that all of these are singletons really. Uh, they might be represented by your user function in multiple pods, but in, in ACA, you've got uh, a cohort, which is a persistent actor, which is also a singleton. And so it needs to be quickly located within that cluster across these pods. ACA takes care of all of that. So again, gRPC communication, gossip, location, uh, location routing to wherever things are located, talking to your data store, all that's happening. So if we look at cloud state as a managed service now, you could uh, pay as you go, as you can with uh, function as a service, um, on-demand instance creation, passivation failover, auto scaling up and down of pods, only paying for what you're using at any given time, just like function as a service. Uh, zero ops, so automated, uh, really automated everything. All that, all that state failure, provisioning, routing, deployment, all the upgrading, uh, canary deployments, things like that, all would be part of the platform. Uh, a little bit about multi-tenancy. Um, in my opinion, function and service has inadequate bulkheading. Um, it, maybe not in all cases, but I know it has happened in AWS, uh, where your neighbor's function can hog, hog resources. Uh, it's not in, in cloud state, if you're doing Kubernetes correctly, if your hardware set up right, you know, you've really got this clean separation of things via the pods and really good bulkheading. And even at the data level uh, where you're, you're assigning different databases to different tenants, you know, you don't share a big data database as cross tenants. I think that's probably the wrong way to go. And complete security to the extent that Kubernetes has security um, do these clear separations. So um, quick look at what a three-tier architecture looks like, what we're so used to, what we call a stateless application looks a lot like this. Um, you've got the middleware in the, in the, you know, uh, the back end running in the middle there um, uh, in a number of pods. You've got a load balancer uh, in the front on the left there, and you've got a, a big database on the right. Um, every single request will have to go to the load balancer to one of the pods, one of the, um, the, uh, the nodes in the middle. It's going to definitely have to hit a database at least once. Um, it's probably going to have some chatter in the middle. Um, it's probably going to hit the database again after, and then it's going to return some data. So it's very noisy. Noise equals risk. Reactive architecture is a lot different in that your database is still there. It's, it's needed as an event log, but it's not needed in real time. The database interaction is never needed uh, for your functions to do their job in real time. Um, the data is already in the functions, the state's already in the functions. They're doing all the work. And when they've done some work, they say, hey, by the way, database, here for next time. Uh, so you really have a, a much reduced risk and um, noise factor here. So um, just a very high level of the architecture, you know, from the bottom up, 
you've of course got any number of uh, you know any if it's a database it could be part of a cloud state instance um, spanner new sql no sql sql uh, all running on kubernetes K, uh, K native um, i'm going to have to take that box away we're not actually utilizing that right now we're new, uh, we are utilizing uh, growl vm for native image and very hard um, utilization on Akka because Akka's uh, clustering capabilities and its persistent actors are the underpinnings of the cloud state entities. Um, now, the above that are the actual um, methodologies we're able to create with that, which is the event sourcing, uh, CRUD, domain projections, where our, uh, which are views um, based upon events happening across your system um, that are kept in sync and built for you by cloud state. Um, that way, when you go to read for a display, it's already waiting for you in memory um, or in a record in a database somewhere. Uh, key value store, similar to Redis, um, and uh, these count click free replicated data types. If you have the need, you know what it is, CRDTs. And then all these languages plus plus across um, any language that has gRPC can be supported. Um, Istio for your load balancer, and then any, any mainstream communication protocol, gRPC, HTTP REST, Kafka, what have you, um, will work. So let's look at some code. Uh, I'm gonna make a little admission before I go into this. I did a lot of Python. Uh, it was in health and wellness. It was for loading uh, a new system with billions and billions and billions of records. Um, that's the extent of my Python expertise, but I did take some Python sample code from our Python Cloud State Library, so you can glean something from it a little bit. Um, but please do check out the GitHub repo when I'm finished. I'll give you the link. So to be able to have a cloud state application, um, regardless of what language you're going to be implementing it, you've got to set up your, um, your protobufs uh, for the gRPC protocol. This is going to be all um, the behavior of your application at a functional level. So in this case, we're talking about a shopping cart. And the shopping cart, we're going to model the messages for interacting with a cart. The one thing you'd like to do with a shopping cart is add a line item, and it would have a product ID, a name and a quantity, uh, and a user ID. Um, if you see that, we're also marking it as a cloud state entity key. So any entity in cloud state needs to be sharded um, with a unique key. So what you're doing is instead of having a, a database um, on disk uh, that has a unique key, which would be user ID, you've got these distributed functions in memory in a cluster that are sharded by user ID. So it's a similar concept to a database table. Um, if you're not familiar with protobufs, you'll see that um, when you say string user ID equals one, you're saying that the data type, of course, is string. What am I calling it? And then what is the ordinal of it? One, two, three, and four, the ordinal of these attributes. Remove line item, again, you have to you tell it's the user ID, which is the ID of the function. Um, and then what is the mandatory attribute for removing a line item? Um, it's a product ID in this case. Um, there's a, the ability to get the shopping cart if you'd like to view it. Um, in that case, you just need to be able to give the user ID key. Um, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, line items here, which are part of a cart. Um, and we model that here with line item and then it's used as a repeated um, collection of items inside of cart. And so now we can have our service that uses those messages uh, in our uh, GRP service called shopping cart. Um, so we can add an item um, and we can remove an item and we can get our cart. Uh, if you're not very familiar with protobufs, this is a really cool feature. So out of the box, if you do a cloud state implementation using Python, any other language, you're gonna implement this gRPC backend for this service. Um, what you're gonna get for free here is if you uh, include this optional section, you're gonna get um, REST just by default. Um, so you get gRPC and REST at the same time. That's what the meaning of those things are. Um, and then it, there's also another um, uh, file here, which is actually your domain. So you can model your domain objects also again in Protobuf. Uh, makes them much easier to share and return as data when, when you have callers. Um, so again, line item, uh, an item added event. So I talked about event sourcing. This is our event for item added. Um, it's got a line item inside of it. This is our event for item removed below that. Um, and then we also have our shopping cart state. So we'd like to be able to return that to a user. Um, so we just have a message called cart. 
repeated line items. So um, this is what it looks like in Python to actually model one of these now. Um, so it's not a real lot of code, it's a shopping cart. You're gonna be able to have billions of them in memory, given that you've got enough cloud hardware in place and cloud state installed. Um, it's fairly guaranteed that you could model the world. There's, there's no limitation if you've got enough of these nodes. And all you need to do is mark it appropriately as a, uh, um, uh, an entity, a data class. Um, there's a little more code in the sample that I think you should probably take a look at where it specifies what this underscore shopping cart and the file descriptor are. It's a, it's a little bit busy, but um, this is some of the code, what it looks like to create a shopping cart in, in there. Uh, you'll see that you'd like to snapshot it. Um, it'll, this is a callback function that is going to actually call for your snapshot when appropriate. Um, if we look further, uh, we'll see that there's a snapshot handler, handle snapshot. This is your callback from the cloud state saying, hey, here's your cloud start, you, you, your, uh, your state. And you would, um, you'd set your state in your cart, your internal state to that. And then you'll have the event handlers item added. Um, you would then, every item added would be called back into you and you would add them to your state. Um, so it's all very callback based. You just implement these annotations and you're, you're in business and remove item if you're interested. That's what remove item would look like. Um, you take your item out of the cart and you return empty. So on behalf of the Cloud State team, uh, we'd like to say thanks. Uh, we'd love to see your interest. We are always looking for contributors. Uh, any questions you might have, we'd love to hear about them. Um, the full sample, I'm gonna leave this up for a few secs. This is where the Python support and with, with the shopping cart sample exists. Um, I encourage you to pull it down from GitHub and take a look and, and run it and play with it. So uh, that's, that's all I have. And uh, let me turn up my volume here. Hey. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for questions. There is a first one. Is for Andre. He's asking if it only runs in Kubernetes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Kubernetes, in our experience, is the way the world has gone. Um, we made a little bit of a bad bet using um, TCOS some years ago, um, and it's very clear that Kubernetes is is where the world is going for cloud. Okay. So, any other questions? If Anyone wants to use a microphone to ask a question, we can also do that. Just raise your hand, click the raise hand button and I can enable that. Or just click in the Q&A and ask a question. Let me check on the channel just in case. Brian. Okay, so. Last call, no takers. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you for presenting. Um, enjoy right. the rest of the conference. See you. All right, thank you.